I would like to start out by saying thank you, all of you, for being here. Thank you for the invitation of VI for coming here to talk about Salmonella. It's a topic that I've been talking about for a long time. I've been working on this for over 10 years now, since my PhD. We don't have to start talking too much about years and dates and stuff like that. But it's very interesting, and I really enjoyed the other presentations. And when I saw the program, I confess, yesterday I was a little worried on how does someone else fit on, into the, all these other problems that were going to be discussed. And I was concerned, I said, this is going to be boring. They're going to be excited about PED and economics and all the other stuff, and nobody wants to know about someone else. But based on what was discussed in the previous presentations in the morning, I found very interesting because it touches a lot of the stuff that I'll be talking about today. And so, in general, we tend to think in salmonella, oh, it's a food safety, public health. It's not. It makes it a little bit more complicated because it's a, I'll call it dual pathogen. It's a pathogen for animals, but it's also a pathogen for humans. So it has dual importance in, ours, in, our, in our job. Uh, just quickly to clarify why the two names there, USDA and Peru. I'm, I'm a research animal scientist for the USDA, but our research unit is based on Purdue campus. So at the same time, I'm also adjunct faculty in the animal science department at Purdue. And this is our facilities where we do a lot of our studies, some of them that I'm going to present here today. When we do infections, uh, challenges studies, we can do controlled infections in our laboratory. Well, first thing we need to start out when we think about salmonella, when we think about our work, our field of expertise, animal production, swine in this case, but also other areas, is we need to realize that the world is changing. And not only the world is changing, our job, our area of work is also changing. We are shifting. We are being seen for a long time, and we are being focused too much in animal production. We start to be seen as food production. So everything we do has an impact and is perceived by the consumer. They watch what we do because they relate to our product. It's what they're going to put on their table. It's what they're going to feed their children with. So we have to start changing our mindset. For a long time, I've been telling people that we've been too caught up on animal production, performance, productivity, referring to the animals, and we forget that what we are, our end product is food. We need to be careful with that, and people are paying attention to that. So what are the priorities? Some of the things that people say, is food safety important or not? And I tell people, yes, it is. A recent survey done to define here in U.S. priorities driving the consumer food choices lists on the top of that preference safety. That's number one concern of the population of the consumer. And the top three here, essentially, what they want is a safe, affordable, and nutritious meal. That's what they want. They de define their choices based on that. Secondary to that, then we have the current issues, environment, welfare. And then the last thing the consumer pays attention to is productivity, profitability. When I talk to groups that are non not involved in the area of animal production, I tell them, say, you've got to be careful, because if you don't have this, you're never going to have that. Okay? It's true. These are all connected, but this is how our end consumer sees us. This is what they want when they plan or they go to the grocery store or when they consume some type of food, any type, they're looking first. Safety, affordability, and nutrition. So we have to have that in mind. We have to be worried about this. Well, but when we talk about food safety, we're talking about two different things. One is security, food security. We need to produce enough food to maintain, to, to, to keep up with the demand. Population is growing, everybody, I have tons of graphs on this, you don't want to discuss this, but all of you heard that by 2050, we're going to pass the 9 billion people on this planet, that we're going to, there's going to be a huge demand for food, that we have to increase our productivity in about 60 to 70 percent, we used to be 70, then they back it up to 60 because of the economical crisis in 2008. But just that, it's a challenge per se. The problem is not only we have to increase that produ production, but we have to do it in a safe way. It has to be safe for the consumer. When the consumer thinks in food safety, or we think in food safety in general, we have three types of food safety issues. One are chemical hazards, residue, excuse me, residues and other things that can go in the product. Physical hazards in swine industry, very important, needles, 
It's a big issue in the, in the pork industry, but these two are usually taken care of based on quality assurance programs or people working in that area. A much more complex issue is biological hazards. When we are talking about biological hazards, we're talking pathogens and antimicrobial resistance, a new issue. One is more complicated than the other, and both are already extremely complex, extremely complicated. So this is, these are two areas that we've been working a lot. And the focus on these two areas have been particularly on farm. What we do on farm that maintains, makes it worse, makes it better regarding these two types of biological hazards. This is very important. Okay, specifically to our topic, how important is salmonella and how important is salmonella in pork? That probably is one of the questions that you have. So if we look in general salmonella or foodborne pathogens, salmonella is the the top, the top one in total number of cases. It corresponds to about 50% of the cases of foodborne disease in the United States. So that gives an idea of the impact of salmonella. What is mostly interesting is that is based on a number that about 25% hospitalization rate, which means about a quarter of it goes to the hospital. All the other three quarters, we barely know it happened. So all these numbers are very likely under estimates of what the real scenario is. So salmonella is a big issue uh, in our society. When we look at productivity losses, in 1999, the uh, USDA Economical Research Service uh, released a report and estimated that $2.3 billion per year were spent or were caused in losses because of medical costs and productivity loss due to salmonella in the United States every year. More recently, another survey shows salmonella is the number one at foodborne pathogens. And, and it goes above $3 billion a year are lost in the United States because of salmonella. So it is a big issue. It is important. It has a very strong economical uh, uh, effect. And we all know, we all probably experienced the intimate contact with salmonella one time or another in our lives, so we know how unpleasant it is and how it compromises our productivity. But to give you an idea how challenging this microorganism is, well, several years ago, the, the, the government established a goal, which is Health People, Healthy People 2010. The goal was for every 100,000 cases to have 6.8 cases of salmonella, 12.3 cases of Campylobacter, and one case of E. coli 157. If you look, since the surveys and the data has become available, if we start looking E. coli, we are pretty much are in that goal. We reached that goal. We're around 1%. If you look at Campylobacter, we did a very good job in the beginning. We had a big drop, but then pretty much stabilized there, and we are very close to what uh, uh, it was the target, but not exactly right there. I think we are in 13, 14 uh, cases. If we look at Salmonella, this is probably uh, a good example of PD. What is pissed off? exhausted and depressed. If we look at this, if you work with someone else and you look at this, it applies to this too, okay? You, we basically did not make any, from a public standpoint, we did not make any progress at all since 1996 that we have data for that, okay? So that shows how important it is and how we need to attack this problem. Well, specifically in the case of pork, we're all here because we are somehow involved with the pork industry, so we need to look at this, how important it is. There are different ways of uh, uh, different attribution reports published in the literature, but going through that, it, they range around the world between 5 and 30 percent of human cases of salmonellosis are due to pork. If we look specifically, U.S., the estimates are about 6 to 9 percent of the cases, and EU is between 15 and 25 percent of the cases. This is a compilation of multiple uh, uh, reports on this. So it is significant. It is something that we have to learn. Yes? How do they determine that number? How do they determine? It, it basically is a statistical formula, and they, they, there are several factors weighed on that. Consumption, level of consumption of pork products, uh, the diagnosis of the cases. Uh, they, they track epidemiologically with the source. And they have very good epidemiological systems where they, they do the questionnaires and everything, so they trace it back, and they do those estimates. They even have, there are some tables that they don't want to bring here, which will, how, what percentage is domestically acquired, foreign sources, and things like that, but have very good uh, survey systems that it's much easier to work in epidemiology in humans than in animals, <laughs> unfortunately. They're, they have a lot of information on this. It's much easier to track that. 
the problem is we know that contamination usually occurs in the processing line. The carcass, the guts, we know the contamination occurs there. However, we also know that that contamination comes from infected pigs or what we call carriers of salmonella. Well, the, the carriers that I'm referring to are those pigs that have no clinical symptom. They grow well. We have no clue they have salmonella in their gut, and they go through the processing system. And as they go through the processing system, punctures, ruptures, whatever happens during that process, it contaminates the carcasses. Okay? And what really determines that food safety or pork safety risk is not only the prevalence, the number of pigs in each group that comes through the processing system carrying the bacteria, but also the levels of that contamination, the levels of that carriage. The higher the levels, higher the probability of contamination, higher the probability of the contamination being in a level proximal to the uh, infectious dose to humans. So that all determines the risk. Long time ago, uh, some epidemiologists in Europe estimated that each infected pig that enters the slaughter lines increases in three to four times the risk of having contaminated carcasses and that loss. Okay, so that's really something that we should pay attention to. Well, what's the scenario in the U.S.? And why I'm saying that a lot of people may think, oh, this is boring, we don't have to worry about salmonella. The baseline was determined in 1997 and for carcass contaminated with salmonella, and it, was eight, it is 8.7%. Below that, which is the average of the industry, nowadays these are, these are uh, uh, market hogs, all sizes of plants, it's, as you can see, well below. The pork industry has enjoyed a very comfortable situation on that and been below that. However, we know that the risk first is there. There is a risk. It's there. We can't rule it out. Second, we know that the USDA is revising those numbers. We know that they are doing a uh, sampling since last year, and anytime soon, that number is going to change. And a big concern of industry is, if they are doing a survey, very likely they're going to start finding something around this. Depending on how much they lower that number, we may have a problem in our hands. We may have to deal with that issue again. So it depends how low that number is going to go. We're going to have to rethink everything about salmonella. If we compare... The, the, the swine industry, the pork industry, with other industries, this is average and you have different sizes of plants, but generally average, we are in a very comfortable situation. 3.6% of positives, and if you look, chickens much higher, ground products much higher, it's a comfortable situation. But, again, the risk is there. How much of that risk we want to take, how much of that risk we want to keep playing with. So when we look in general, and we were talking earlier today in transmission and systems and chains and everything, I like to have that idea. Part of my training is a, as an epidemiologist, so I like to look at things as a model, as a system. And some of these things that we look, when we look salmonella overall, this is essentially what happens. We have the salmonella at the farm, which we really don't know a whole lot about, and we're going to discuss a few things today. But we know that we have pigs coming out of that farm with a certain level of prevalence, okay? Certain frequency of salmonella in their gut. When they're subjected to transport, that level goes up. That frequency level goes up. Then they go, they're subjected to the pre-processing or pre-harvest. I don't like the term uh, slaughter, okay? And I think, as again, back to what we mentioned before when we were talking about we are not an animal production anymore. We are food production. Uh, uh, experts or professionals in that area, we need to start being careful what kind of terms and names we use. And so we, that's something we'll have to start thinking. But after Larage, that prevalence and frequency and, and levels go up. And this is what is entering the system, the processing. So essentially our salmonella risk as we move through this chain goes up. And that's one of the, some of the things that we're going to discuss here today. What are the contributing factors that uh, make that system operate that way? So what do we know, first of all, quickly, what do we know about salmonella infection pigs? A quick summary, you don't want to spend too much time on this, but we know that traditionally transmission fecal oral. However, there are several studies until a few years ago showing particularly in other species, more recently in swine, it's been shown that it is possible to infect or transmit salmonella via aerosols. There are some elegant studies done where they kept pigs and separate boxes or rooms and just with a tube connecting them, so just air could circulate between them, and how, the, particularly in that case, that case was a salmonella type of muru, how it, it got to the other room, it was transmitted by aerosol from one group to the other. 
we know that there is a rapid dissemination throughout the gastrointestinal tract. As soon as these pigs are infecting, in less than two hours, we have this salmonella, not only throughout the gut, but also being shed in the feces. Okay? Then we know that the disease, under experimental conditions, is very difficult to reproduce. We've, I've done, I lost track how many challenges studies, and it's really rare to cause a clinical disease under experimental conditions, unless you're dealing with very young pigs and you give them a very, very high dose. But normal nursery growing finisher pigs, you can give them easily 10 to the 8th, 10 to the 9th, which is a very low dose. They don't care. They just keep growing. They just keep carrying that bacteria, shedding everything. They have immune response. They have everything, but they do not develop immune, uh, uh, sorry, they don't develop the, the disease. It seems to be needed a reinteraction between the dose, the serovar, and immune status to cause the disease. This is very important, serovar. Why am I saying this? When we think in pathogens, we think, oh, salmonella is one pathogen. It's not. Salmonella in in reality, essentially, we are talking about over 2,500 different types of salmonella, serovars or serotypes, whatever you want to use the term, okay? So when we're talking about salmonella, we're not talking about one pathogen. We're talking about potentially 2,500 different pathogens, all in the same group, and they all are different. They have different invasiveness, virulence, uh, different uh, ability to... Uh, provoke seroconversion, and all these factors play when we're talking about salmonella. We know that salmonella is very resistant, very hardy in the environment, and that's one of the things that I'm going to hit. We need to be careful. We need to pay very good attention into hygiene and disinfection, cleaning and disinfection, because salmonella, it is, it is very, very resistant. It's very capable of staying and persisting in the facilities. And a very low dose, enough, this will be easy dose to get in any contamination, 10 to the second, 10 to the third, it's enough to infect a pig. Okay? So any failure in your process of washing, disinfecting facilities that leaves a residue of about 10 to the second salmonella, and you are done. That lot is going to get it. Okay? Infected pigs can carry with no clinical symptoms an intestinal tract and lymph nodes excrete high numbers of salmonella in the feces, and this is another point important. That shedding can be intermittent or continuous. We don't know what determines that, okay? But we know, we suspect, that there is also this interaction playing here, depending on the serovar, the dose, and the immune status of the animal. That's going to be what is, may determine how much and how often they're going to shed. If it's continuous, intermittent, what's going to happen with that? A quick example, a study that we did a long time ago, when we showed also we did this. Basically, we infected some shedding, shedder pigs for a few days with a very high dose, let them establish the infection, contaminate the whole room, took them out of their collected samples, and those samples in the floor had about 10 to the second, between 10 to the 10 to the fourth. And we, then we brought in another group of pigs that was negative, and we put them in their room and collected samples at two, three, and six hours. Bottom line, all of them, we were able in all these times, particularly, for example, at two hours, we were able to pick up that salmonella in the lymph node and the cecal contents, ileum, and also shedding. So just to show you uh, that what I'm talking about, I'm not lying. It is amazing. I and mean, we've done many, many studies where in two hours you can get all those pigs positive easily in the fecal samples. Uh, another study that we did more recently, we wanted to understand the dynamics. So we got these are uh, grow, uh, finishing pigs. We infected them with a high dose of salmonella typhimurium and followed them and collected fecal, uh, uh, killed some pigs and collected ileum, cecum, rectum, mesenteric lymph node at 24, 48, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 weeks post-challenge, and you can, these pigs had no clinical signs or at all, and then at, 40, at 24 hours, they already had, in all the system, in all these samples, they had 10 to the third to 10 to the fourth. It went up, up to the third week. After the third week, something starts, very likely the immune system starts kicking in, and what's happening, it starts dropping, and then it drops dramatically between the fourth and the fifth week. So it takes time for the animal to respond, to build an immune response, and to be able to clear that infection. Okay, this is a high dose infection, but we wanted to push the system to see uh, what will be the case, what will happen on that. Okay, more specifically, when we are talking about on-farm risk factors, that's what we are here for. We want to know what we are doing, what can we do, uh, where are we screwing it up, where are we doing something right, something wrong uh, that is causing our pigs to have salmonella. 
I wish I have all those answers, but we're going to try. What we know is that a variety of potential risk factors have been investigated all over the world. We get literature and we, uh, we're going to see quickly, there's a, uh, we, we wrote a review, we published a review on this, and it's unbelievable the amount of information that, that, that is available out there. However, there are some considerations that I'm going to make towards the end, but the problem is when you start digging to, through the literature and controlled studies, this is what you end up with, conflicting findings and reports. You're going to find a report that's going to tell you that factor X is a risk factor, and uh, another report that tells that same factor X is contributing to protection. And which one do you believe? Which one is true? What are the confoundings? What are the factors in that? So that really makes us think it's way more complicated than, than we thought it was. One point that is extremely important I would like to emphasize is feed. We spend, in our production systems, most of our cost is feed, right? Uh, used to be until a few years ago, 60, 70 percent of the cost. I'll guess today it's easily 80. And especially talking to other people, they tell me a lot of production systems nowadays say 80 percent of my, my cost is feed, okay? The problem is we are so concerned with price, with cost, with performance, but we forget that feed is also a potential risk factor. It's a whole different system. We had a discussion this morning on infection chain, on transmission chain, and everything. Feed is part of that chain, and feed is a chain on its own. If you go to a feed mill and you follow the whole process of feed, the reception of the, the, the ingredients, all the processing, until you get the final product, until that final product is delivered in your farm, you have a whole chain of factors there, and some of those are risk factors. So this review, there are several reviews. So for a long time, uh, 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 feed has been seen just as a source of infection uh, or uh, something like that, but there are several other issues that need to be discussed. We're going to go touch on a few th of them quickly today as examples, but from several reviews, this is a very good one that if you work in swine production or you work particularly with uh, salmonella or if you work with uh, quality control in your feed meal or so, you should read this paper. It's very, a good, very good group of epidemiologists and people and they discuss exactly all those steps and how they can contaminate your feed. Okay? As we look at the literature, in 2004 there was a publication, this was mostly targeting uh, poultry. Uh, feed meals, but it's essentially the same, and they, they, the sample size is very small, but they basically look at the three different feed meals, and they look at the mixer and the pellet meal, and you can find, you can see they were all contaminated with salmonella, but what it strikes here is the pellet, much lower contamination, okay, the frequency is much lower. The same thing here, and they determine Enterobacteriaceae and Salmonella. They looked at both, but here they do, in the first one they look at the feed samples in the end, and here they look at the dust samples collected in different areas. And the same thing you can find. However, you see the environment is highly contaminated. So the pelleting process, which involves heat, yes, it controls the contamination of your feed. It doesn't eliminate it, and we're going to talk a few more about this in a few seconds, but it doesn't eliminate it, but it helps. So it's a process, a process, something that we need to pay attention to. The same study, when they looked at they were looking essentially at salmonella status versus uh, uh, enterobacteriaceae and levels they get in there. So I summarized this table in a different way, but you can tell that the mashed had much li higher levels of enterobacteriaceae, total enterobacteriaceae, than the pellets. And I summarized it here to make it easier, the average of those. But what was interesting, the salmonella frequency, it was 9% of the mash feed samples, 4.7, have actually half and it was statistically, statistically significant. So that shows how mashed feed is in a higher risk of being contaminated with salmonella than pelleted feed. Another study, this study was more recent, is done in Spain, and they did a large survey in multiple feed mills, different capacities, different seasons, different species of animals, but essentially they didn't find any difference on them, and this is roughly what you're going to find in your feed mills as a, prob a, pro a probable uh, uh, frequency of salmonella contamination. About 3 to 5 percent of your feed will be contaminated with salmonella. Okay? And they looked at different areas, they collected dust samples, and one that strikes here is dust from the intake pit. 26% of your samples in the intake pit are contaminated. 
So everything that goes there has a chance of being contaminated. So what it's, it's not only contamination happening inside the feed mill. It's coming with your ingredients. It's coming with the feed stuff. And some of these they show also, and they show all of these that we usually don't associate with salmonella for a long time. When I was starting to work on this, I don't need to tell when that was, but it was a long time ago. We were all thinking salmonella, first thing you would think, oh, look if they have any ingredients in the feed of animal region. Oh, that's a source of salmonella. For a long time it was that. Well, if you start looking here, they got soybean meal contaminated with salmonella. Barley, sunflower meal, fish meal contaminated. Corn contaminated with salmonella. Wheat, cotton. This cotton seed seems to be very consistent. I've seen probably four different, different surveys and always these cotton seeds are high. I don't know why, I don't understand anything about cotton seeds, but there seems to be something there because it's consistent through several studies. Wheat flour also contaminated. So any of these ingredients is potential source of contamination of your feed. Okay? Uh, they also did a study and they show the same thing that the previous study done in the U.S., that non-pelleted feed have a higher frequency of positive samples for salmonella, suggesting that pelletizing your feed helps controlling that. However, there comes the other surprise. The pelleted feed, yes, may have a lower risk of being contaminated because of the thermal treatment. But when you feed your pigs these different types of feed, meal, wet, or pellets, Look what happens with your risk of infection. Animals receiving pelleted feed are at higher risk of carrying salmonella. So something happens in the form of the feed, generates some environment in the gut of these animals, which I can tell you right now, I'm sure someone is going to ask, I don't know what it is, but something happens in the gut of these animals depending on the form of the feed that they receive, and it changes the susceptibility for colonization of salmonella. There are several studies done. This is a large one that I found from Canada and 89 different herds, and they clearly show the progression. You have, you use your, uh, your meal, uh, so mashed meal, uh, uh, as a standard, your number one. When you wet that feed, it jumps to 3.5 times higher risk of being contaminated with salmonella, the pigs. And then they give them pellets, it almost five times, all of them statistically significant. So feeding, the pelleted feed has a lower risk of contamination. However, if you feed pelleted feed to your pigs, they are going to be in a higher probability of carrying that someone out in their gut. So again, not that easy, not that simple. Some people say, how, how crazy are you to work on a complicated field like this? And I tell people, I'm not crazy. I just have job security. That's the only thing. It's going to be always something to do on this. It's not that easy. Other risk factors that we have to deal with. Am I, I'm okay with time? Okay. Uh, other risk factors that have been shown everywhere. Occurrence of clinical salmonellosis, both systemic infection, cholera suis or some other uh, serovar, or enterocolitis, mostly typhimurium. There are several studies showing farms that have, and it makes sense, they have on a, a clinical case, they tend to be positive and maintain high levels of salmonella for a long period of time, and I'm talking months. Okay, so then it makes sense. You have clinical uh, uh, sick animals, what happens? They're going to shed much higher levels to the environment. Your environmental load is much higher. And if your disinfect clean disinfection process fails, you're going to have persistence of the bacteria in the environment. So that's a risk factor. If you have a system that has a clinical case, you've got to be careful, extra careful, because the risk is higher. Several studies have been done trying to look into co-infections as a risk factor. And several suggest that peers has been shown that in, under experimental condition, there's a, a, a nice work done in 2000, uh, I think it was at Iowa State, and where they did uh, experimental infection and they show how pigs with peers shed higher levels uh, and carry higher levels of salmonella. I think it was cholera so is they were testing that paper. I don't remember which serovar it was. But they showed how pigs with peers, uh, uh, they had high levels. Others, most suggestions from field surveys show that Lausonia might be, particularly from, there are some studies in Europe showing uh, a, a, a strong correlation between uh, a serology for Lausonia and serology for Salmonella. So there's got to be something there. Uh, PCV2V, or virus, PCV2 virus, also has been shown recently to be a risk factor. Pigs infected with PCV2 had higher levels, become more susceptible, particularly to developing uh, clinical salmonellosis when challenged. Uh, some parasites. 
one point of consideration that I would do with Lausonia, as I said, I haven't seen any infection study. Most of them are based on serology. But we have to think, when you think as an epidemiologist, you're thinking risk factors, you have to understand not only can be a cause, direct link between the pathogens, but it may be just because they have the same risk factors. Okay? So that's a, a, a note that I would like to make there. Uh, several studies showing continuous flow versus all in, all out. Hygiene, disinfection, cross-contamination between lots. Important. Makes sense. It's being shown. Nose-to-nose -nose contact between pens. So you have pens that are not solid partition. Those are higher risk of transmitting between groups of pigs and spreading higher prevalence is expected usually in those lots. There are studies showing that. These two factors are important. Number of pig suppliers or number of sources. Just probability. If you ever play the lottery, you know what I'm talking about. The more diverse your source of pigs, the more pigs you mix, higher probability that you're going to hit or you're going to bring in a group of pigs that have the pathogens that you don't want there. Okay? So that makes sense. However, a strong note has to be made there. Breeding herd. We tend to, and it was called attention in the earlier presentation today, we tend to neglect the breeding herd as a source or a, maintenance, a source for the maintenance or persistence of the bacteria in the herd. Okay? These are animals that essentially they are in a continuous cycle because if you bring new animals, you always have older, older animals. They're constantly being exposed. So the pathogens that once enter in that group, in that population, it's not going to be easy to eliminate them because you're always going to have fresh population coming in, fresh animals coming in, and then you have a recycle of that pathogen. Okay? So that's something that we have to be careful about. Uh, people don't pay attention to that, but we have to be careful. Second is they're the strongest source of infection to the piglets, to the most vulnerable population, the piglets. Remember, when the piglets are born, theoretically, their GI tract is sterile. Okay? That the first 48 hours is when the colonization of the gut starts. It's established. First microorganisms they are exposed to are in the vaginal canal when they are in the birthing, uh, birth process. Right after there, the first exposure that they have is to the environmental contamination of the ferrin crate, which is essentially determined by what? Feces of the sows. So if the sow is positive, what's going to happen? Very likely in those first 24, 48 hours, with a very weak immune system, what's happening? Those piglets are exposed to the salmonella. And a lot of people will think, oh, but this is a pathogen. We, it should, shouldn't be a problem. And if they don't get sick, I don't have animals getting sick. Salmonella, one thing you have to keep in mind, it can be a pathogen. But essentially, it's not. It's a commensal. So we're trying to get rid of something that is a commensal in the gut. So it's expected to be there, but we don't want it there. So it is very easy. It is adaptable to the microbial ecosystem in the gut of these piglets. And so the breeding herd, to me, in my perception, and based on several studies that I've seen, it's a very important source of early colonization with commensals, but also with pathogens for the piglets. And those are the ones that they're going to carry three weeks later, four weeks later if you're in Europe. They're going to be wind, they're going to be stressed, they're going to be mixed up, they're going to be handled. Easy to what? Shed and spread. Also, what we've been talking about, biosecurity, hygiene, and disinfection. I, try to, I, like to make, I know these are part of a biosecurity, but I like to highlight this because it's amazing when you go to a farm when you see how much failure there is in the cleaning and disinfection processes. There are, you can go there, and there are several people that I know that collected swabs and clean. You look at the facilities, they look perfect. They come back and you can find tons of bacteria in those swabs. So it is something that a lot of people neglect. Several studies are showing, particularly salmonella, the hygiene of the employees. There are some large surveys on risk factors showing employees, farms that change boots, don't use the same boots every day or don't use the boots that come from outside the farm, change clothes, shower in, shower out, wash hands often, how they reduce the risk of salmonella in those facilities. A big discussion that's been going on on food safety right now is alternative production systems. And I didn't know if anybody was in that area here, so I decided to just include one slide to call your attention. 
a recent study published showed a higher prevalence of salmonella and toxoplasma in uh, antibiotic-free outdoor swine production systems. And there's been a lot of discussion ongoing on that, if that may be a risk factor. And people think, well, wait a minute, these are different farms. It's a risk factor to the pork market. Uh, the big concern recently, we had this, this discussion with people in the industry, the big concern, even if you are not in the alternative production system, whatever you want to call it, if there is an outbreak and it's traced back to pork, and even if it's an alternative production system, the consumers don't care. It's pork. Everybody, it's in the same boat. Okay? So it might be a risk factor. We don't know. We need a whole lot of more studies on this area. But it's difficult to do this. These have to be very large, field-based studies, expensive, complicated to get access to these facilities. But it's something that we don't know. This is a, 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 a um, part of our market that it's growing. And we need to understand what are the implications, what are the potential risks of concerns that we have on this. Okay, so that's, those are the key points that we have to talk about the farm. Then we move beyond the farm, which I call the limbo, when I spent a lot of years recently between the farm and the plant, and the, the processing plant. I call it the limbo in between because it was forgotten for a long time. I call it peri-marketing, peri-harvest management practice, but essentially is what happens in the farm right when we're getting those pigs ready to go to the truck, and what happens in the transport, and what happens when they go to the processing line. Uh, also, the study that we did some time ago, we showed also, a lot of you have seen this, how holding pans are extremely often contaminated with salmonella. It's very easy to go there. I review in my studies, several of the studies that we've been part of, probably from six, seven different large capacity plants in the U.S. The average, every time you throw a swab in the floor of those pans and you collect, and I'm saying before we put pigs in, that's when they hose it down, usually they're ready for the next lot of pigs, about 75% of your samples are going to come back someone out of positive. Okay? Then we have the pan samples, then you have the trailers. Of course, in this case, we collect samples after these pigs uh, left the trailer. Then we have drinking water in those pans, often contaminated with salmonella. So what we did in this study was we selected a pan, went there, they washed the pan, we collected swabs on these pans. Isolated salmonella, serotyped all of them, waited until a truck came in. As we moved those pigs from the trailer to the, tr uh, the, the truck to the pan, we went in the trailer and collected pulled samples of that trailer. So those, we, ass we assume, those are probably the serial bars of the pigs came in, they were stressed in the transport, they shed everything. So we want to compare that to what they met with at the pan when they came in. And then after the, the, the processing line, we collected samples from these pigs to see if we could match the serial bars that we found in these pigs. They will match more the truck, which we expect it to be, to be the case, or more to the pan to see if they were picking up those salmonella. And for our surprise, we matched more often the serial bars that we found in the pigs to the pans than really with the trailers. So that shows how that, they know, in the first study that we did at experiment infection, how quickly they can get infected, and they show that it happens in the real world. We have to be careful with the large pans. Another study, just quickly to emphasize that, we did later, we got, we got a bunch, uh, several lots of pigs that we let them unload the truck, and stay half of them unload the truck, stay in the pans, the other half we kept them in the trailer. We did not have, let them exposed to the, pan, the pans. And when we collect samples, 40% of the pigs that went through the pan were positive, 13% of pigs that would stay in the trailer were positive. Again, showing that those large pans are a high risk. So essentially, this is what happens when the pigs come into the plant. They're basically swimming in salmonella when they get to that large area, and we need to pay attention to that. That's something important. It's an important risk factor. Now, there are other factors that we need to consider that. When I started in this position uh, uh, with the USDA in, in Purdue, it's a group that works a lot in animal welfare. So the main question they had was, is there any link between welfare or stress and food safety risk? Do we need to look into this? It's something we need to investigate. And we know that between the, the farm and the plant, there are several potential stressors, not only in the larage, but also during the transport of these pigs. So we did the first study that we did was on a large producer and we wanted to see if the practice of first or last pull or close out, whatever you want to call it, has any effect on the prevalence of pigs with salmonella. So what we did for, uh, if I'm not wrong, these are six farms, six lots in each farm. 
And what we did is we went there the day they were getting ready to remove the first pool, the first half of the pigs. And we collected samples from those. Okay? Did bacteriology, followed these pigs to the, 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 plant, to the plant, collected uh, diaphragm meat samples to do serology. And then three weeks later, we went back and collected also from the close out group, did the same thing. And this is what happened. From the bacteriology, fecal is uh, shedding, with the prevalence is statistically increased from the first pool to the close out about 9%. Serology jumped 31%, which means there was some active infection going on there. What could cause that? We go from stressing these animals. Remember, pigs are very social and they establish their hierarchy in the pens. So once you take the bigger pigs, most likely they're going to start fighting again to determine who is the dominant or not in that pen. That stress them out. They're going to shed more salmonella, infect them more, and spread more the infection. That might be one of them. Of course, we have to account for another issue that people don't think about. The first group of people that comes in, the workers that come in to sort out the first pool, they go pen from pen marking these animals. They jump from one pen to the other. They may be spreading the salmonella around, and then when they remove the larger pigs, the, other, the salmonella is left in all the pens for the second group to pick up more salmonella and stimulate immune response. Whatever way, whatever cause, we know it's a risk. When you do the first and the second and the close out pool, you have to be careful because the prevalence of salmonella changes between them. We did a field study funded by the National Pork Board with a large producer also, where we followed pigs, lots of finishing pigs, for four weeks, collected four samplings in each one of these lots for four weeks, and the average prevalence was 4.5%. The day we mapped the, the barn, so we knew exactly in which pans most of the positives were from, from those pans we picked 30 pigs, because we wanted to have pigs that were positive or shedding or intermittently shedding. Loaded them up for the transport trailer. Our own trailer washed, disinfected to avoid cross-contamination, and we found 11.3%, but it's still statistically the same. Transported these pigs, drove around with them, that was a lot of fun, for about two hours. As we unload them in the packing plant, before they even touched the floor, we jumped in the trailer, started getting the samples, that frequency of fecal shedding jumped to 20%. Let them go to the larage pen, came back two hours later, that prevalence jumped to 42%. Okay, so showing how this progression occurs. Another study that we did, a more controlled study, we want to say, okay, question that we had, if a, we know that they pick up more salmonella and all this, but what happens if I have a pig that is infected already with salmonella, has salmonella in their gut, and we stress this pig, would that, would that pig, the levels of salmonella in the gut of these animals go up or no? Does it change? No, approaching the different aspect of the risk, remember, prevalence and levels. So we look at the prevalence, now we're looking at levels. When we look at levels, we had four groups of pigs. And we had a control group. These pigs were individually housed in pens with water, feed. Nothing changed by themselves. Other pigs were subjected to a 12-hour feed withdrawal. Some, some places they still do that. Uh, feed withdrawal for 12 hours. Some of these pigs, two-hour transportation. And of course, the combination of feed withdrawal and transportation. We infected these pigs a few days before to make sure they were all positive and follow them. As soon as we applied the treatments, we uh, euthanized these pigs and collected helium, sequin, and rectum contents and looked at the levels of salmonella. When the helium, the feed withdrawal, and the feed withdrawal with transport statistically increases the level, the concentration of salmonella in the gut of these animals. In the sequin, only the combination of feed withdrawal and transport is capable of doing that, and the rectal contents, no change. Of course, it tells us there are differences, but at the same time, there might be something that we have to be worried about is the timing. Maybe if you give it more time, these levels will migrate to the rectum and we may pick it up later. But we, we didn't have enough pigs to keep doing hours and hours and hours and not enough people to do that. But it shows that there are some effects there in different parts of the gut. Then we did the opposite. So let's say if pigs are not infected with salmonella and we want to stress them and see if they're going to pick up salmonella faster or higher levels of salmonella if they become more susceptible to salmonella. So what we did the same thing, we, infect, we, we did not infect these pigs, but we subjected them to four different treatments. Individually housed, separated pigs, control, another group of pigs, we were in the individual, and then we mixed them with an unfamiliar pig. We brought a pig from outside, negative two, and let them fight. Let them set up who is the boss, and they do. As soon as we put in, in less than 30 seconds, they start fighting to see who is the boss. Okay? Transport for one hour, 
and then mixing, transport and mixing, mimicking what happens in the real world. You load up the pigs in the farm, transport, put them in large pens, they're going to fight. Okay? And what happens when we infect them with a low dose, we gave them a 10 to the 4th dose of salmonella, and see how much of that we could pick up again in the gut of these animals. And if we look in the ileal contents, very similar to what happened in the previous one. Levels of pigs that were mixed or transported mixed, they pick up higher levels than the pigs in the control group. Okay, they basically pick up almost, and particularly the combination of stress, they almost pick up everything that we gave them. It's in the ileum in less than six hours. Okay, and the cecum, the first three, three treatments did not affect, but the combination was capable of increasing that concentration. Showing again, different regions of the gut will respond different to different stress, but that stress is a risk factor on these, this group of pigs. So what we learn from this is that pre slaughter stress increases shedding and levels, Therefore, it's an increased poor safety risk, okay? So those are, those are risk factors that we have to think about. General, or more academically speaking, we know based on those studies that the microbial populations are not, as the effects are specific to some bacteria because on those pigs we also did total E. coli, coliforms, other groups of bacteria, and we did not see any changes, so it seems to be specific to salmonella. Some other studies have done, for example, exposure of salmonella, E. coli, for example, in vitro, to mediators of stress, epinephrine, norepinephrine, cortisol, and they show differences between the bacteria and the different mediators. We also know that the effects is dependent on intensity and type of stress that these animals are subjected to. And we know, of course, depending on where the bacteria is located, that's when you're going to have your higher or lower risk. More recently, we just finished a study that was funded by the National Pork Board. There was a question, and I thought it would be interesting to throw it in here because it's a hot topic right now. There was a question because a few years ago, a group from K-State uh, published a few papers showing that uh, use of DDGS in the diets of beef cattle increased the frequency of E. coli 157. So several people came to us and said, hey, does that happen with pigs? Would pigs receiving DDGS be at a higher risk of having salmonella? So we did a study where, we did actually two studies. In one of the studies, we had three treatments. We let them adapt to the, to the diets, zero, 20%, and pushed to 40% DDGS in the diet. And I'm saying pushed for some. Some are already using this protein, or even higher than that, okay? But we gave them two weeks of these diets and gave them a very low dose of challenge to see how quick they were going to start shedding, to kind of measure susceptibility. And what we found in six hours after challenging these animals, the control group was not shedding. None of the pigs in the control group shed uh, within six hours the salmonella. 20%, 25% of them shed salmonella. 40%, 41% of them shed salmonella in six hours. Okay, pretty interesting. However, we did a second study when we picked two doses because of space, design, everything, and we, got, we went to the control and the most common level about 30% long time, three to five weeks infected and follow them for several weeks to see what happens. The three and five weeks after they were challenged to see if the colonization, the persistence, they will continue to shed if there was a difference in there. And what we see was very interesting. It basically switches. So at three weeks, the control group is shedding more, and at five weeks, even more than the DDGS group. So what seems to happen is, we suspect on this, is that the DDGS inclusion makes the environment in the gut easy for salmonella to get in, to be, make the animal susceptible to pick up the salmonella faster and shed faster. However, as time goes by, particularly three weeks, that gives them time to clear up that infection, and they actually start shedding lower. So what, how, from a practical standpoint, what will be the implications of that? For example, pigs receiving the DGS when they're exposed for a few hours to the larage pen, guess what? they might be more susceptible, pick up more salmonella. However, at the farm level, as we're dealing with several weeks of grow finishing, it doesn't bother. It's not a problem. Okay? So this shows, and the, the, goal, the idea of showing this project to you is, is very simple. We just started with this. It's not even published. We just finished analyzing this data. But it's to show, to emphasize what I talked before. Feed is not just feed. Feed, when you're feeding the animal, you're feeding the gut microbiota. And it can change. It has an effect. We have to be careful. We have to learn more about how feed affects these factors. It can be a, a risk factor. It can be a, a help. But it has to be considered, and we oftentimes ignore that. So 
Essentially, after all these, we last year published a review on risk factors with a colleague, Todd Calloway from ARS Texas. And essentially, our, our discussions ended up on this. Some other college and epidemiology are extremely dynamic. Things change, okay? So your risk factors may not be the same everywhere. And we use some other data that we have from other farms to show how dynamic it is. This is prevalence bacteriological, fecal samples, or meat juice samples. Over time, each one of these points or this data is essentially six lots, six sites, six lots in each consecutive lots in each one of these sites. And we measure, we collected feces and matched and followed them to slaughter, collected meat juice and did serology. And as you can see by the standard deviation, all of them, it's pretty high. So what gives you an idea is even within the same site, different cohorts will gonna have different prevalence. Your prevalence will, because you sampled the lot today, the, lot, the next lot doesn't mean it's gonna have exact same prevalence. And these are all within the same company, very similar diet, management, everything, facilities and all that stuff. So it changes over time. It, it's dynamic. It's not static, okay? What happens, what you conclude from this is you cannot base your measures just going there, getting a sample from these pigs and say, oh, I have that prevalence. This is what I'm going to do. Uh-uh. You have to monitor longitudinally to know the dynamics, how it's progressing, it's increasing or not. Do you have uh, an active infection going up or down? Do you have sort of conversion or not? What's going on? So it's a very complex issue that we have to deal with. We tried also to correlate on 36, on those 36 uh, lots that we had individual, and we tried to see if there were some specific uh, correlation between serology and bacteriology. We could only find a moderate correlation of 0.59, so it's not perfect. Of course, we're measuring different things. And that's one of the things that I've been discussing a lot, particularly in Europe, where they based a lot on serology, the salmonella surveillance systems. You have to be careful because there's first a temporal disassociation between them. When you're measuring fecal or excretion, you're measuring the infection at that moment in time. When you're measuring serology, you're measuring a seroconversion, a response that took time. Whatever generated that title already was done before, probably two, three weeks before, okay? So these are different ways of measuring, and there is a lot of discussions on this, which one is the best way to do it. But we wanted to see if there was any clusters of the farms. Each one of these letters is a different site uh, that we sample, and we couldn't see any specific cluster to see if it was maybe high prevalence, would be more clustered in a specific region than the others. No, they vary from lot from lot. Some critical issues to consider that I told you that we have to think about when we're dealing with uh, salmonella. Time? Oh, I'm okay with the time? Okay. Uh, differences and inconsistencies observed. Some things that we have to be aware of when you're doing your research, your test, or whatever it is. Sampling source is very complicated. Different places, different studies, different companies, producers use different sources of sample. Samples collected at the farm, samples collected at the abattoir. They're different. Remember, we have all this in between the limbo, which I call the limbo, in between the farm and the plant. Everything may change in that part that may compromise your sample. Uh, sampling design. You, uh, you see all these studies, and it's unbelievable how much it varies. Size, how you select your samples, cluster, not cluster, random, whatever you want to do, how many samples per lot, type of sample, if you're doing FICO, if you're doing SICO, in each one of these points. Diagnostic approach, a lot of people don't consider this. Serology and bacteriology, as I said, they're different, we have to be careful. But more than that, within each one of these, these are two factors that are oftentimes neglected. Different methods will have different sensitivity, different specificity. So sometimes you have to be careful when you compare results, if, especially if the methods are not the same. And particularly in salmonella culture, it's amazing the number of different protocols that it's out there. It's very complex, very complicated. Other thing that I like to call attention, differences between production systems. Not only as I showed, there are differences between sites within the same production systems, but also if you can imagine what happens between different production systems. And here I like to call the attention. We have a tendency, particularly food safety and some other disease we've been discussing earlier today. Oh, what happened in Europe? What's happening there? Why did it happen there? Oh, it's going to happen here. What is coming from there? What we? we have to be careful on these comparisons. We have to understand. First, there are complex issues like this, pathogens like this. There are differences. But forget the complexity of the pathogen. The systems are completely different. If we're dealing, for example, with feed, 
gut microbiota or things like that, you have to keep in mind, diets in Europe are completely different than diets used in the U.S. Diets in the U.S. are based on corn and soybean. Europe doesn't have much corn and soybean. Most of their diets are what? Wheat, barley, they use a lot of fiber. So their microbial ecology has got to be completely different than the ones that we have here. We have to be careful. And that applies to pathogens, to gut microbial ecology, to everything you want to know. Gut health, you have to be careful when you transfer those things. We have to look, of course, but we have to analyze those things. And a lot of studies, when you look at risk factors, for example, they do not mention the diets these pigs were on. They just measure different, and that might account for some of the inconsistencies that we find because they were just in different diets. So what can we do about it? I wanted to create a problem, and I realized, I said, okay, I don't want to leave everybody with a PED, living here with a PED. So I said, well, at least I can point something quickly, what can be done, or at least a broad overview. But there's a big discussion, pre-harvest or post-harvest interventions. Which one should we do it? It seems that post-harvest are more efficient. And essentially, if we look at the numbers, the proportion of pigs that are carrying salmonella in and the proportion of carcasses that are coming out with salmonella, post-harvest has been doing a very good job in controlling those because that, that contamination pressure is very high and consistent, persistent. And they're doing a very good job in keeping that low. So with that in mind, what I tell people, pre-harvest are not useless. In fact, they may contribute to make your post-harvest interventions even more efficient. If they can control from 40, 50 percent, bring that down to 3, 3.5 percent, if you can reduce the pressure coming in, that effect might be multiplied. So we have to think in terms, same thing as the transmission, everything. it's a chain, it's a system, everything is connected. We have to think about that. What can we do pre-harvest? This is number one, strict biosecurity, hygiene, and disinfection, and I can't emphasize that enough, we have to pay more attention. I've hear that since I was a student, which is not very long ago, very time ago, but until today, it's amazing how it still persists. It's a very basic, simple problem that we have. I used to have a professor that I started going to farms with him, and he used to be very picky, particularly in the farming house. He would go with the people and say, these floors, this facility, this room has to be so clean that I should not be afraid of putting my food on the floor and eating it there. And it's true. His immune system is much more efficient than the piglet, newborn piglet. And it's true, but it's rare to see that. So basically what we have to do matches what was discussed before. We have to reduce the risk of exposure and we resist, uh, reduce the persistence uh, of the animals. We have a lot of peri-harvest transportation areas measures that we have to take. There are different ways, controlling stress, risk factors, leverage pens, some other things, but not the topic today that we can discuss. And this is throughout the system, from breeding to finishers. It cannot be done in one point, okay? More specific on that, we can, there are a lot of information about probiotics, prebiotics, organic acids, essential oils, and so forth. You can go on that list for several slides. Well, you can ask me, the focus here is manipulating the, the gastrointestinal microbial college. And a lot of people will ask me, Would that, do they work? And I say, well, it depends. Typical academic response, it depends, okay? Uh, not by itself, and I think that's probably one of the main issues in most of the studies, the lack of consistency on all these additives. They're done under that, that, that situation, that scenario, and, and not as a whole, as a package, okay? These are very interesting tools, but there is no such thing as a silver bullet to control someone else. Forget it. It's not going to happen. It's a very complex issue. As you've seen, I, I hope you got the general picture on this. But it's going to take multiple of these measures combined uh, to be able to do something. More than that, there are also some more specific uh, 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 interventions available, other topics for discussion, not today, but I just wanted to give example. <coughs> and these two papers, there are more, but these two were picked on purpose because they are from uh, products and uh, from uh, uh, BI, and I help review these papers and I know them. But there are vaccines in the market and other two other areas that I've been, other area that I've been working on too with some colleagues at Purdue is bacteriophages and other technologies coming up and it helps a lot. Particularly in our focus here is controlling rapid infections before, right before uh, processing. 
and we did, we've done some simulations on this, and it works pretty well, we've seen, okay? There are companies working on that too. But these two, I want a vaccination and bacterial phase. I wanted to give you some more specific examples of targeted interventions to a specific pathogen that is coming down there. However, everyone has a critical role. Producers, processors, retailers, and consumers. From the public standpoint, everybody has a role. Doesn't matter if we do everything right here, let's say in these two, and here they abuse the product, or here they abuse the product. We have to understand, animal products are not sterile. They will have their microbiota. We are, as animals, we are more microbes than really humans. Okay? We have more microbial cells in our body, and every animal has, than really our constituent cells. So unless you treat that final product, which the consumer doesn't want, you radiate, do something like that, you, we cannot expect these products to be sterile. They, can, they have to be treated properly. Okay, so that's a very important point. So everyone must be committed. And in the case particularly of these two, I like to call the attention because I know in our case, a lot of people have or work for a producer or work in a large integrated company. It has to be an agreement between the pre and the post harvest side. You can't do whatever you do in the pre-harvest thinking you're solving a problem. If they screw it up in the post-harvest, it's not going to help. If you do everything in the post-harvest and you don't do anything in the pre-harvest, it's not going to help. So it has to be, uh, there's got to be a commitment for different parts of the system. With that, I would like to acknowledge everybody that has helped me in my research and the, and the unit at ARS, colleagues at Purdue, Dr. Brian Ricker and Paul Abner at Iowa State, Scott Hur and James McKean, undergrad and grad students, the cheapest labor we can have in the world. They work for a piece of paper for their diplomas in the end. We've all been there, but it's important, and they help a lot. What we do, we like to acknowledge the funding sources of our main funding sources of our research program, USDA and National Pork Board, BI for the invitation today. I have not here. That $2 million check is ready for me. Okay. Uh, and also, all of you for your patience and for hearing for us today. If there is any question that I can help answer, thank you very much. Okay.